And with that, we'll move on to one of our wonderful speakers. So we're really excited to have Nietzsche Acharya here today. And let me tell you a little bit about Nietzsche before we get started. So Nietzsche has an amazing background. It is pretty impressive. So let me get that information up. So Nietzsche leads the Equal Innovation, um, an organization that collaborates with leading universities, governments, foundations, and companies to assist them mm -hmm to integrate innovation and entrepreneurship with their impact-focused strategy. Nish is also a senior fellow with the Clinton Foundation and a contributor to Forbes and the author of the India-US partnership, One Trillion by 2030 by Oxford University Press. Nish previously served as Director of Innovation and Entrepreneurship and Senior Advisor to the Secretary of Commerce for the Obama Administration and as Executive Director of the Deshpanad Foundation, a prominent American philanthropy foundation on innovation, entrepreneurship, and also he served in the administration of President Bill Clinton as well. He has been quoted prominently worldwide in the New York Times, The Economist, Newsweek, Economic Times, India Today, BBC, Bloomberg, Bloomberg and NDTV, just to name a few. So everyone, Nish Acharya. Thank you so much, Monica. I, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak to this group. I've uh, had the chance to speak to XPRIZE um, a few years ago and about global innovation and particularly innovation in the developing world. Uh, and then I've worked with New Profit for, for many years uh, as somebody based in Boston and also New Profit is here in Boston and been a real big fan of the venture philanthropy concept. So uh, I'm very pleased to speak here. And as it turns out, I, I know some members of some of the teams uh, who have reached out to me on LinkedIn. And, and so that's been great. To, and so hopefully my uh, remarks won't be redundant to some of them. Um, I wanted to touch base on, on a few things today, uh, just a little bit about innovation in this space, and then uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the challenges in terms of the skilling space and how, to, how, how, how difficult it is to, to achieve change um, you know, beyond your innovation, but also then tell you two examples of, of programs that have worked at achieving some sort of scale uh, with their programs and, and, and talk a little bit about why those pathways and those broad-based partnerships are so important, and, and that journey is so important from innovation uh, to scale up. And so hopefully at the end, um, you know, I will have been helpful in thinking about this broader uh, skilling ecosystem for you, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Uh, next slide. So uh, without advertising, just a little bit about the work that I'm doing. I run an organization called Equal Innovation, and we're really focused on the fact that there are uh, so many startups now around the world that are focused on mission and impact. And so uh, there's about 5,000 accelerators around the world now. These are tech transfer centers, innovation centers, accelerators. Um, and uh, there's two interesting points to note about them. Most of them are not in San Francisco and Boston and New York. They're really spread around the world. And so uh, as our speakers were saying earlier, XPRIZE believes anyone uh, can innovate and, and successful innovation can come from everywhere. We really need to do a better job of doing that because the venture capital is still in those three cities, uh, even though we know great ideas are everywhere. Uh, we also need to, to think about the challenge. You know, when you look at skilling, for example, there's several billion people in the world who need skilling support, either skills uh, because they're younger and haven't entered the workforce or reskilling uh, because they are, uh, you know, been uh, moved out of one industry or another. And so, you know, the four things that we're really focused on are that idea of inclusivity, the idea of equality, that every good idea deserves a chance, uh, that the ecosystems and communities are really important, the old saying, it takes a village, uh, and then commercialization must happen faster and more efficiently. Again, going to this area of skilling, uh, if several billion people around the world need some sort of skills development, education, or reskilling, uh, it's not going to be uh, the, you know, the one founder wins model. It's going to have to be multiple uh, startups, multiple technologies, all winning a little bit in different parts of the world. And so um, if we move to the next slide. So I wanted to share just a little bit of the challenge uh, in the skilling and reskilling space. It, it unfortunately does not happen at the speed of innovation. And I thought I'd bookend the last 20 years uh, as we talk about the internet era. So in the early 2000s, uh, you know, it was becoming clear that in the American economy, young people needed to develop the skills for working in technology. And the job opportunities were with companies like Microsoft, Cisco, which are still around, Sun Microsystems, which some of you may remember and some of you might not. 
Um, but the example here I use of, is of Sun, but pretty much everybody went through this where they actually invested significant resources in developing curriculums for high schools, community colleges, uh, colleges, uh, all sorts of nonprofit organizations to train young people uh, in, in Java programming language. But the way the American system works, it took, uh, and also the way their grants were, were organized, it actually took two academic years before students could take those courses. And right in the middle of that, Sun announced that they were gonna uh, outsource several thousand Java programming jobs. And so you can imagine you're a high school uh, principal and you're saying, do I offer this Java programming class? Or you know, they just announced that all those jobs are going to India, Philippines and elsewhere. And as you can imagine, um, it didn't take off. And so uh, the speed of technology, the speed of globalization um, was happening so fast that uh, you know, it, it just didn't take off as a proper training uh, activity in American schools. And, you know, as a result, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the, the programming talent uh, continued to be abroad or programmers coming into the United States on programs like H1B. Uh, and this wasn't just Sun, Microsoft had this problem uh, with its own work. Uh, and then Cisco had an incredible set of networking academies to, to train young people uh, in the Cisco technology and how to use it. Uh, but went through a lot of those similar iterations of launching something, and by the time the curriculum is developed, uh, it was out of date. Uh, and for those of you listening who think that, you know, well, that, that was 20 years ago, technology now is much better, we have AI, we have this and that, um, we know that that's not the case because there are still structural impediments to reskilling quickly, right? So right now, one of the biggest is that financial aid through FAFSA and other programs is really only available for the largest online education providers. And, uh, and so the Coursera's and others, you can use your Pearson loan, you can use others, uh, but the government is a little bit wary of for-profit providers and uh, it's only those large ones that have gone through the process of, of, of making, making it available to students. And so we, most people in the United States do require some sort of financial aid for their reskilling. And so if you can only do it through a few outlets, that is certainly a barrier that needs to be addressed. Uh, the other one is that most Americans don't go to um, elite or, uh, schools. They don't go to four-year colleges. They take multiple years uh, and they take their training uh, at other uh, institutions, whether it's workforce development boards or, or local nonprofits. Uh, and, and they are also not built to introduce courses with new technologies quickly. It's, it's not fair to take something that's really cutting edge technology, like, a, like some of the AI or VR stuff that many of you are working on, and ask community college to turn it around really quickly. And so uh, that challenge remains as it was 20 years ago, that how do you quickly get something approved? Um, and again, thinking that you know these courses, uh, if they're offered in public institutions, uh, it's only fair and, and responsible that they go through a vetting process where we know the technology works, we know that learning occurs uh, and that it leads to positive outcomes, whether those are jobs or job opportunities, uh, whatever the outcome may be. But, you're not gonna just introduce something until it's proven. And so while we might cut the time from two academic years, it's highly unlikely we'll cut it to uh, less than one academic year simply because of calendar and, and approval process and all that stuff. And, and we may not like it, but you know, there's no um, MVP in this work. It has to be a proven, uh, proven solution in terms of learning focus. Um, a couple of interesting other things that I would mention is, you know, Coursera now is launching and retiring courses in just 18 months. And so again, this is a really interesting challenge for the reskilling space that we are seeing uh, technologies needed in the marketplace come and go at a really, really rapid speed. And so what all of you are doing with your innovations becomes really important because if that's the case, then we know that this infrastructure of community colleges, nonprofits, workforce investment groups just will never keep up. And so of course, Sarah with its resources and the technology platform and the, the millions of users uh, can't keep it going more than 18 months, then we certainly need to think about, um, you know, what technology tools uh, must we use and put into place. And the last thing I'll mention is just that micro-credentialing, which is sort of talked about in this space that you can uh, reskill in a different setting, get a micro-credential, stick it on LinkedIn and go from there. Uh, the reality right now is that most large employers are not necessarily recognizing micro-credentials uh, unless it's from a few uh, specific uh, institutions or online uh, education providers. And so, uh, you know, the quality is very hard to rate, the quality is very hard to discern uh, of a credential. And unless it's a well known brand, uh, you know, we don't know uh, what that person actually learned or what credentials they have. 
Now you can say that that's the same for our higher ed system anyways, uh, but there are more checks and balances there because it's been around for a while. And so all that is not to say that the technology is not going to be transformative. It's just that we know there are societal challenges, both from a regulatory side of how we approve content and skilling, uh, but also from sort of a cultural aspect of how people learn uh, and you know the resources they have to spend on learning. So these are all things that I think all of you are gonna need to think about as you uh, go into the reskilling space and are looking at your VR tools or your, your uh, technology tools to rapidly skill up. You know, it's one thing to have a bunch of folks in, a, in an early trial, I think 5,000 is the goal here and that's amazing. Um, but you know, when will that translate into approval to go in the California community college system, which has hundreds of thousands of students at any given time. So, so some things to think about from your perspective. Next slide. But there's been two models that I wanted to bring up where I think they have shown that you can be successful in reskilling at scale uh, if you put in the right time and energy in understanding the customer and understanding the, the context, both cultural as well as uh, economic, right? So the Deshpande Foundation, where I used to work, um, runs a skills development program um, in India. And, and, and it actually started after I left. So I had nothing to do with this program uh, other than to, to know that it's there. Uh, but they really looked at the context in India where uh, the economy is growing really, really fast. Uh, and there's a need for lots of workers in the economy, but there's no way that a country with a billion people is gonna build lots of campuses uh, and offer lots of uh, multi-year degree programs. It just doesn't make sense. And so what the foundation did, like a lot of skilling programs, uh, is focus on a couple of things that were clear needs in the economy. So drivers, uh, basic sales skills, hospitality industry, and, and then IT customer service. And over the course of the last decade, they went through this journey uh, that really had four stages. You know, the first was sort of developing the local knowledge and relationships uh, in the communities they were serving. So uh, no matter where you are in the world, there's sort of a cultural context. Uh, there's a reason people go to school or do not go to school. There's family pressures, there's other opportunities. Uh, and so they spent a lot of time, and again, this is not strategic, this is sort of what happened, if you will. I spent a lot of time developing that local knowledge and relationships to understand what the context is around skills development. So it turns out uh, that driving is just not something people wanna do uh, unless they're in big cities because it takes you far away from your family. Uh, it's hard to get married. There's all these things that you don't think about when you're building a technology or designing a curriculum that turned out to be very relevant. And so that's why the soft skills became very important as well. The cultural issues, communications, presentation skills, how do you dress, all this sort of thing. And, and we do the same thing here in the United States with with a lot of our workforce programs and, and teaching this sort of professionalism, if you will. Uh, their next stage was to then experiment with what types of skills development uh, was going to be useful. And instead of jumping in on one specific thing, um, you know, they initially actually started with the idea of supporting entrepreneurs and finding brilliant young people, helping them start a company, uh, and then they would become the employers in the region, uh, employers who would then hire th hundreds of people, thousands of people, uh, and by supporting that elite leader, they would you know, create jobs in the region. Uh, and that's, that certainly works in Silicon Valley, works in Bangalore, which is a big city in India. Uh, it doesn't work everywhere else. And so uh, that idea of the elite fellowship program, the entrepreneurship master's programs, they are important, but they didn't lead to large scale job creation or skills development uh, through that. And so what then you started to see was this pivot towards um, basic skills development, which is again, driving sales, things like that, but much more greater reliance on partnerships uh, and, and some sort of a model by which the person participating in the class in the skills development program had some more skin in the game than they did otherwise. And so they introduced this wide ranging set of programs. They did it in partnership where uh, the foundation was developing curriculum, providing uh, seed financing. So vendor financing essentially for the students to participate in the program. Uh, and then paid back over the course of their uh, sort of income, similar to a student loan. Uh, but the foundation provided the capital for that student loan because banks were not gonna do it for somebody who's gonna be a driver at a hotel or you know, do IT customer service. And so they, they found alternate sources of capital to do that. So they, they figured out the model for partnership. They figured out the, the, the lending model with the participants in the program. Uh, and then ultimately they were able to find corporate partners who worked with them uh, to do specific tracks like hospitality where a lot of the big 
hotels would work with them to train workers year after year, or just general, you know, sort of community development where they were uh, developing a skilled workforce. And they were able to build out a uh, much broader ecosystem uh, that looked at this stuff in a regional view, not just as a technology or a specific course. Um, and so now they're one of the largest skills providers in the world in terms of uh, skilling annually, 8,000 people skilled, some in a residential model, a lot of it in a, in a virtual or satellite campus model uh, that where local colleges provided the, the solutions. Um, and I think what I wanna leave this on is, it's the largest such program, but it ha and it has low rates of attrition, but not insignificant rates of, of attrition. And that's something to know uh, that no matter what you do with a lot of these skilling programs, you know, these issues of culture, communications, presentation are still real uh, and they, somebody can work and get a, you know, an A in the course. And once they join the workforce, they can still have you know, challenges working with uh, other real people, you know, working in office for the first time. All these things are, are real challenges worldwide. And so even when you do something really, really well, some of these other issues prevent us from getting us all sort of where we wanna be. Uh, next slide. Uh, more close to home here in the United States, another program I wanna highlight is the Urban Manufacturing Alliance, uh, which is a partnership of the Urban Manufacturing Alliance, Century Foundation, and Clinton Global Initiative. Uh, and it's really uh, around called Industry and Inclusion. Uh, and their sort of journey was uh, slightly different, but you know, again, sort of building out what needs to be done and the partners that need to go there. And so they were looking at uh, the needs in the manufacturing space. You know, I think the data shows that we'll need at least 2 million manufacturing workers in the United States over the next decade, simply based on retirements, attrition, uh, growing, um, you know, growing uh, uh, opportunities in sectors that will stay in the United States, such as defense and others. Um, but then, you know, we've also read these uh, trends about supply chains uh, reshoring, uh, you know, some of the manufacturing to the United States or initiatives to bring uh, new industries and keep them in the United States. So maybe that number is bigger. Uh, we don't know. Uh, but we don't have the workforce to fill it unless we maximize the people who live in our community, the workforce that is hiding in plain sight, as some people are saying. So people of color, women, those particularly in urban areas or uh, peri-urban areas that can come into the city. And they're currently underemployed, but they've gotten, this, a lot of them have gone through school and received an education. So it's not similar to the Indian context where you're starting uh, often from scratch. This is where you provide some targeted training and you have a, a large workforce potentially available to you. And that's what they're focused on doing. So recently they've, uh, their latest cohort, they have 22 colleges, the community colleges nationally that have signed on and they developed this 18 month advanced manufacturing credential program. And, and so, as I was talking about earlier, the, some of the challenges with, with the, the time frame and, uh, and what have you are there still. Uh, but in this case, they feel that the advanced manufacturing areas they're focused on uh, because they're product based, uh, because they're you know tied to patents and things like that, uh, they're going to continue to be relevant for many many years. And so they've tried to address some of the challenges I mentioned earlier that Sun Microsystems and Coursera and others have had. Um, so they built this community network, and then they really focused on urban areas because, as we know, for better or for worse, urban areas have the power of the concentrated labor pool, consumers, infrastructure, all of that stuff. And so uh, it made sense to focus on urban manufacturing. The makers movement is a is generally been around tech hubs and universities, and so the next generation of products are coming out often of these urban areas, and it's it's important to stay close and grab those workers when those products start to take off. Uh, and then one thing that's always been important to me, we don't think about, 67% uh, of American patents are related to manufacturing. And so when we think of patents and intellectual property, you know, these days we think of Silicon Valley, we think of tech but the reality is the vast majority of it is really to manufacturing. So innovation plays into this and the role of innovation and commercializing it in the United States uh, and having local workers who can work in those industries and train for it. And so, you know, in this model, they're really hitting upon uh, a bunch of the challenges we have and then trying to do it in a concentrated manner. So we do need a rural manufacturing alliance as well. Uh, and hopefully somebody will think about that uh, model and how to build that up. And I know New Profit's done some work around uh, rural and small towns. And so uh, we need that as well. But the urban manufacturing one um, is really an interesting one to me because they're trying to connect the dots with innovation and, and workers, again, hiding in plain sight who could join these industries. So um, 
I think that's the end of my presentation and really just wanted to thank you for the opportunity and share a little bit about you know, how groups have been uh, tying together the different, uh, different, uh, you know, different parts of, of the skilling ecosystem uh, in order to have an impact, but also how, how difficult it is even when you're doing amazing work. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Nish. We appreciate that insight. And I think it's really great to see what people have done before the current teams are competing and to learn from what has happened before them and institute some of those changes and those learnings and what they're doing now.